So hi everybody, I'm gonna get started now. My name is Max Murray. I, it's good to see you all. I appreciate you all joining today for one another one of our uh, webinar sessions here at Faceware. Uh, I'm the sales director for Faceware. I work with a lot of our CGVFX teams, gaming teams primarily, uh, including the Nesting Games team, which is where our presenter comes from today. You guys probably know him. This is Simon Habib. He's done a couple of webinars with us in the past. He's been a long time Faceware user and supporter. Uh, and today we brought him on to just kind of overview a lot of the really cool areas he's been working with with, uh, with Unreal and, and giving over an overview of some of the courses he's been doing. So I don't wanna take up much of your time, Simon. I know you have an intro for yourself, but I wanna also first just say thank you for doing this. I, I'm really appreciative of your time and going through all this. You put a lot of effort into this and it's really cool to see you do this live to give everybody the awareness of this course so that everybody can kind of get a lot out of what you've put together. Um, but before I hand it over to you, I also want to say to everybody else that's watching the format of what we're going to do here today. So uh, but after I kick things over to Simon, Simon's going to present for a while. He's going to show you, give you guys an overview. At the end, we're going to do a Q&A. We usually do something like this. We reserve 15, 20 minutes towards the end here. If you have any questions about what he's presented or if you have any questions in general, uh, yeah, throw it in the go to webinar question field. Uh, we will go through those as soon as we can at the end. Uh, you can save them to the end, but as you as you add them, we'll have them at the end there. Uh, and then if we don't get to your question by the end, because we do have a fixed time here, then of course we'll do follow up after this. And I'm, I believe we're gonna give all these questions to Simon so that he he has a way to get a hold of all of you. So without further ado, Simon, please, the floor is yours, yours man. Awesome, thanks so much, Max. Uh, hi everyone. I'm really excited to host this second webinar. Uh, if you're tuning in, it's probably because you know that we'll be talking about uh, MetaHuman Facial Animation, and uh, specifically a course that I helped to put together for Faceware, and uh, which is hosted on the Epic Games Unreal Online Learning Platform. Uh, we'll be looking at an in introduction to Faceware Analyzer and Retargeter. Uh, before we begin, uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Simon Habib. I'm currently working as a lead cinematic animator at Nesting Games. It's a relatively new studio in Quebec City, but uh, I'm fortunate enough to be working full-time from home in Montreal, which is very convenient, especially on very cold days like today. Uh, well, I can't say too much about the project just yet. Uh, I hope I'll get to host another one of these webinars uh, to properly showcase our game when the time is right. Um, uh, I started my career in 2004 as a character rigger for the first 10 years. But about eight years ago, I did a kind of a big pivot and dedicated my, my time to facial animations and performance capture and the pipelines that support them. Uh, last year, I was fortunate to host my first GDC talk to present the facial animation pipeline for Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, which I helped to develop while I was at IDOS Montreal. Uh, a month later, Faceware invited me to give a longer version of that presentation, including a really extensive Q&A. So if you haven't seen it yet, I strongly recommend that you check out uh, Faceware's YouTube channel. And finally, to see a list of all the other titles that I've shipped, uh, you can check the link below. To kick things off, let's watch this short introduction video, which is actually module one of the course. Uh, it provides an overview of all the modules included in the course and the high-level topics that we'll be covering during this webinar. Welcome to an introduction to Faceware Analyzer and Retargeter. In this course, we'll be looking at how to animate a character's face based on an actor's performance. Upon completion of this course, you'll be equipped to track a recorded video and retarget it onto a MetaHuman's facial rig using Faceware Analyzer and Retargeter, then preview it in Unreal Engine 4. To begin, we'll talk about Faceware, the multiple software they provide, and the differences between a real-time approach and an offline workflow. We'll discuss the pros and cons of using footage from an existing performance, a webcam, or a head-mounted camera, as well as the importance of framing, focus, lighting, and frame rate. Using various tools and methods available to edit our media files, we'll maximize our time and the overall quality of the tracking in Analyzer. We'll get familiar with Faceware Analyzer's interface and its core concepts. With a few tips and tricks, we'll explore how to improve our tracking results by ensuring consistency and minimizing redundancies. With our performance videos tracked, we'll examine how to translate this data onto our MetaHuman character by creating custom facial expressions in Faceware Retargeter and generating believable facial animations. To wrap up the course, we'll import our animated MetaHuman character into Unreal Engine 4 and explore how to render out our sequence into a video. Now that you've seen a preview of what we'll be covering, 
let's begin by exploring the features that Faceware offers. Uh, before we dive into each topic, let's take a look at how to find the course itself in the Epic Games Dev Community page. Uh, feel free to follow along in, in case you want to explore the modules as we cover them in this presentation. Uh, so to start, to find the course, you can visit uh, dev.epicgames.com slash community. So uh, at the top of the page, type in Faceware, and then when prompted, you can click on Search Learning. Uh, otherwise, you can click on Learning on the, in the left column under Type. In the search results, you'll find Part 1 and Part 2, which are labeled Faceware Analyzer and Faceware Retargeter. Clicking on either of them will take you to the table of contents where you'll find the course overview and the different modules. Another option would be to go back to the homepage and type in Simon Habib. Uh, you'll find the two parts of the course and my guest appearance in an episode of Inside Unreal, which I also recommend that you check out. As you'll notice on the website, the course is split up into two parts. Both parts of the course are meant to go hand in hand, uh, but if you're already a user of Faceware looking to improve your skills in either Analyzer or Retargeter, you could choose to follow just one or the other. Part one is focused primarily on capturing the facial performance, editing the footage, then tracking it in Faceware Analyzer. Throughout the course, I go over some best practices and some useful tricks along the way. And in the last module of this part, I introduce some more advanced concepts like tracking models uh, that allow users to automate parts of the pipeline and batch process the tracking. Part one of the course starts by asking why adopt Faceware? Uh, to animate a face from scratch, animators typically need to keyframe every expression in key poses, then manually adjust the transitions for the entire timeline. This gives us great looking animations, but can be very time consuming. Manually creating key poses is still an important part of working with Faceware, but they only need to be created once during the training phase. On every frame of our timeline, Retargeter will evaluate uh, our, our performer's expression and then identify the closest pose among the ones that we've provided and interpolate the values, giving us accurate transitions between expressions. If we decide to take an uh, offline approach, that means we're not aiming for a real-time performance. We're looking at a two-step process. Uh, tracking a facial performance video in Analyzer first, then applying that tra tracking data onto a character rig to generate animations using Retargeter in a DCC of our choice. Uh, this course covers how to get started in Maya, but the principles remain the same whether you're using 3D Studio Max or Motion Builder. Uh, before we start tracking our footage, we need to actually record it. Uh, there are many factors to consider, uh, so let's break down a few of them here. The first step would be choosing the right type of camera for our needs. For example, a head-mounted or stationary camera. Uh, in the course, we go over the pros and cons of adopting each one. It's important to have proper framing to make sure that our performer's face takes up as many pixels in our video. The difference between a 30 and 60 frames per second frame rate means that we'll catch twice the amount of data and reduce motion blur. A properly diffuse lighting means that shadows and harsh lights won't disrupt the analyzer's tracking, while the focus ensures our pixels remain sharp and easier to track. Even though facial markers aren't evaluated by analyzer, choosing to apply dots on our performers can really, can really help make manual adjustments uh, in, the, in the tracking in analyzer without having to guess where to place the landmarks. And lastly, keeping our videos short mean that we'll avoid carrying unused frames, reduce processing time, and keep our work files light. After we've recorded our footage, it's best to edit our videos before bringing them into Analyzer. There are many video editing software out there, but in this course, we take a look at two options. DaVinci Resolve is a free video editor with a user-friendly interface, and FFmpeg is a very robust code-based solution that can be automated using Python. I listed here a few common manipulations that, that we typically want to make. Um, in addition to changing the size of our videos, we can shorten the duration, combine many videos together, add or replace an audio track, or convert image sequences into videos, just to name a few. Here's a closer look at the Faceware Analyzer portion of the course. An important part of learning any new software is getting familiar with the interface. So we'll go through the various menus and toolbars, the navigation options, the playback functionality, as well as, uh, 
as well as some useful hotkeys. Uh, to get the most out of our tracking results, we'll learn about Analyzer's core concepts. To manually track an actor's face, we manipulate markers, also known as facial landmarks. Adjusting landmarks will set a training frame on the timeline, which is what Analyzer uses to interpolate and to track the performance. To store all of our training frames and update our tracking across the timeline, we execute a two-step process called train and track. The concept of a facial ROM, which is short for range of motion, allows us to train Analyzer on a wide variety of expressions in a short amount of time. Uh, tracking models are a collection of training frames for a given performer across multiple videos. This allows us to quickly track new videos with minimal manual adjustments. It's also useful for working uh, iteratively from one job to another and for building a facial profile within our team of animators. And to be able to automate the whole pipeline, we'll look at how to set up a batch process using Python. Um, after we've gone over Analyzer's fundamentals, we'll explore some tips and tricks, which I've listed a few here. Uh, taking on a less is more approach means that we start with only a few training frames, we allow Analyzer to calculate the in-betweens, and we only need to insert new training frames where needed, then rinse and repeat. Uh, consistency is key, meaning that human error and inconsistency between our training frames will actually confuse Analyzer and will likely result in shaky tracking. Um, we'll look at how to avoid that. Working outside in makes it easier to identify the position of certain landmarks. For example, with the mouth, it's better to start with the corners and the center and then adjust the in-between landmarks accordingly. Clip booking between training frames is one of my favorite ways to ensure consistency because it allows us to compare them with the training frames that came before and after. Copy pasting landmark positions might seem uh, Give me a sec. Yeah, sorry. Copy pasting landmark positions might seem obvious, but it's actually a way to save time between common poses and to only make minor adjustments where needed. The undo trick is, a, is actually a, nif a nifty way to compare our current tracking results with the previous ones. Uh, toggling back and forth will allow us to see if our tracking results have actually improved. Uh, if we realize that the quality has regressed, it may be because it might be a sign that we're missing training frames or that some frames need to be adjusted. Uh, part two of the course is focused on applying our tracking data onto a digital character using Facial Retargeter. Every studio and production's facial rig is unique, so we'll take a look at how to set up a character so that Retargeter understands which controllers and animatable, animatable parameters uh, to drive. Similar to Analyzer, we'll talk about some best practices, some useful tricks, and ways to automate parts of the pipeline to generate hundreds of animations at a time. And finally, we'll look at importing our MetaHuman character into Unreal Engine and rendering out an image sequence. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Facial, Facial Retargeter is a plugin for Maya, Motion Builder, and 3D Studio Max. In this course, we'll explore it in Maya, but the workflow is identical regardless of which platform you choose. To get the most out of our facial animations, the course covers these core concepts. During the character setup, we assign our facial controllers to one of three face groups, the brows, the eyes, or the mouth. Retargeter offers the possibility to create a default expression set, which consists of 50 generic poses that can help us get started with a first pass animation called autosolve. The alternative to using the expression set is to create custom and unique poses that better match a specific performance. It might take a bit more time to create custom poses for our given actor, but Retargeter will provide us with much more accurate animations. To iron out some jitters and pops in our, in our animation, we can set pruning and smoothing values specific to each face group. And similar to Analyzer's tracking models, Retargeter's shared poses allows us to generate um, allows us to collect all of our custom poses to generate new animations by considering all of those poses, um, including the ones created in previous scenes because of that iterative process. Shared poses also allows us to automate the retargeting process and generate several high quality animations with no manual input. In module four, we go over some basic Python scripts to set up a batch process. To improve our workflow with Retargeter, the course also introduces some tips and tricks. For example, 
Displaying the tracking results directly in Maya will help us to identify whether some jitters in our animation are coming from the original tracking or from our custom poses. Using the Butterworth filter as a post process to smooth out certain areas of the face can be very useful, especially with controllers that drive the asymmetry or larger parts of the face. Uh, Retargeter tends to reset the look at during blinks, so we go over ways to fix this. Uh, flat or symmetrical poses can give that CG look to our characters, so incorporating some asymmetry can really help to sell the realism in our performance. And to review our work, it's best to place lights and cameras in our scene than to play blast our results into a video or image sequence. And finally, we'll look at how to export our facial animations into FBX files, which we'll import into Unreal Engine. Depending on our workstation, Maya may or may not allow us to review our animations with a real-time playback. Play blasting a video allows us to review our work with a consistent frame rate. It's also useful for sharing it with team members or for submit submitting it to our lead for, for approval without having to ask them to load uh, a Maya file. Uh, this video over here is an example of a play blast from Maya after retargeting and polishing our animations. The hungry purple dinosaur ate the kind zingy fox, the jabbering crab, and the mad whale and started vending and quacking. Uh, it's a bit of a silly video, but it's, it's really short with the purpose of assembling this, this performance uh, throughout the course. Obviously, I'm showing you the kind of the, the final product out of Maya, and then we'll see what it looks like in Unreal. So onto the Unreal Engine part of the course. Uh, there are several uh, tutorials and courses out there uh, that teach us how to create a metahuman from scratch and to set up an Unreal project. Uh, so for the purpose of this course, we mostly go over how to import our metahuman blueprint and our facial animations into Sequencer. The quickest way to demonstrate this is to start from the metahuman sample project that we can find on the Epic Games Marketplace. Uh, starting from this from, starting from the, the sample project allows us to edit our own camera cuts and adjust the framing of our performance without having to create them ourselves. Uh, being able to adjust our animations directly in Sequencer with our proper framing, lighting, and cameras is also super beneficial. Just keep in mind that any changes that we make directly in Sequencer will likely be lost uh, if we decide to return to Maya and re-export our FBX files. Uh, the last module of this course covers how to render our performance out of sequencer into an image sequence, then assemble it with audio to generate a, a video. Over here, we'll take a look at that rendered animation from Unreal's sequencer. The hungry purple dinosaur ate the kind zingy fox, the jabbering crab, and the mad whale, and started vending and quacking. Uh, so what's next for me and Faceware? Uh, well, the biggest news I can share for now is that Nesting Games will be uh, among the first studios to adopt Faceware Portal. In case you don't know, this is Faceware's brand new cloud-based neural net facial tracker. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, uh, if you want to know more about Faceware Portal, I'd encourage, I, I would encourage you to check out the webinar from last November. Uh, essentially, this speeds up the tracking process without having to set up a tracking model in Analyzer. I still believe that understanding Analyzer's fundamentals is essential for working with Portal, since it can be used for manual adjustments and setting up a proper pipeline. As a fan of narrative-driven video games, uh, I'm constantly on the lookout for new experiences and other game, de game developers that are pushing the boundaries of interactive storytelling. Of course, a key, key component of that is believable character performances and accurate facial animations. On my end, uh, I'm always thinking of personal projects like short films or testing the latest uh, updates to Unreal's MetaHumans. If you're interested, you can check out some of those projects on my YouTube channel called Echo Performances. And lastly, I'm open for ways to contribute to the animation community like tutorials, podcasts, short experiments, or webinars like this one. Uh, before we wrap up the presentation, I figured I'd throw in this video showcasing the out-of-the-box tracking results from Portal. So as I was mentioning, there's no manual tracking here and no prior training, meaning there's no tracking model. Um, and you'll also notice that I'm footage of myself because I didn't have access to a head mounted camera. Uh, and for the purpose of these experiments, I tried to get a metahuman with my likeness to try to see you know, how close can we get from this sort of pre-recorded footage onto a uh, digital double.
if you want to see the before and after of, of this tracking, all that is, is up on my YouTube channel as well. So that brings us to the end of my presentation. Uh, I know that it was mostly like an overview of a three hour course, but if any of the topics that I presented seem interesting to you, I strongly recommend that you go check out the course itself. Uh, if anything, you could just scrub through different modules and see what catches your attention. Uh, we've got some time to tackle some questions, so if you haven't posted them during the presentation, feel free to do so now. And uh, if we don't pull your question from the bunch, feel free to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn or any of my other social platforms. And while we're chatting here, I'll let this video loop in the background. It's a collection of different clips from some of those personal projects that I've been working on uh, over the last two years. So that's it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Simon. That was awesome. Appreciate that. Let's jump right into questions. I know we have a bunch here, uh, so I want to start from the top, really, and answer some of the ones. Some of our, uh, just for everybody's awareness, some of our moderators are answering questions in the chat, too. So, um, But I do just, for everybody's awareness, it's helpful for some of those to be answered publicly. So one first one here was, um, the space where work in Unreal Engine 5, I saw you were using Unreal Engine 4. Yeah, so th this course was kind of a, a long time in the making. So at the time that uh, that I recorded it, it was Unreal 4. Uh, Unreal 5 was actually in early access at the time. So we, you know, building a course on an early access platform is kind of risky. So that's why uh, most of the course is in Unreal 4, but the principles are all the same. Given that I'm not using any very um, advanced uh, features of Unreal 5, uh, the, the Unreal 4 still still works for, for everything that's shown. Cool. I got a question from uh, Nikhil who says, what's the best time, to, when is the best time to bring in the facial animation? After the final movement or camera animations are done and ready or is, do you have to make some considerations around this? It's an interesting question. Um, I would always advocate for full performance, but that's kind of like a, a luxury, right? Like if you have access to a mocap stage or an extend suit or something like that, that's usually the best way to ensure consistency between your audio, your face, and your body. Uh, otherwise, I guess it's a bit like a chicken and the egg, right? It depends what is the focus of your performance. If it's kind of like a, an emotional scene and you know that the face is going to sell the shot the most, I would say probably start with that. And then you could have a, a, a keyframe animator do the body or even do a performance capture just you know body mocap shoot after the fact and kind of mime on top of that performance if that's if this is really the key of your performance uh and then the flip side is if it's an action scene and you're the camera is distant and you're not really seeing the face it can kind of be like i don't want to say an afterthought but it could come secondary so that would probably be my uh my approach yeah piggybacking off of that he, he also asked um if we are doing body and face capture separately how do we sync the movements across the two um are it Oh wait, it just disappeared. Oh yeah, how do we sync the two? Uh, how can we line them back up in the edit to make it feel congruous, congruous with the body animation? Uh, there's different methods. Um, for example, if you recorded the the facial performance first, uh, you can always add some some beeps. I've seen some some teams have like insert three beeps to kind of catch your timing before your first word. That's one method. Uh, the tried and true method is the clap. Just you get like a really peak in a big peak in your audio, uh, and then you're you're able to kind of time yourself with that. Um, then uh, if if you're recording the body performance and you don't really care about the, the audio quality, you can have just a microphone nearby or even just like a, a small microphone just to just to get the the your body performance's audio. And you try to time yourself with your original audio kind of on playback, and uh, and hopefully your your motions will will line up properly and give a, a cohesive performance. Cool, I got a question here from Rick that says, does the lighting need to, to be diffused only on the face or does the background interfere with analyzer in any way? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it depends how harsh your lighting is. Some overhead lighting can actually kind of like bleed into the face. Like if you've got like a really strong spotlight behind you. Uh, so yeah, the ambient light can, can actually affect it. Um, what I would recommend is indirect lighting as much as possible. It's kind of hard to to choose where you're going to be recording your session, um, but keep that in mind that uh, the uh, external light can can affect as well as the as well as whatever light you have fixed uh, on your face. Here's another one about um, 
on, on the performance capture side, how important is it to use a character with the same facial structure as the recorded actor? I'd go as far as to say that not at all. Like we, we've, no, that's having the likeness tends to be more fun for like behind the scenes and things like that, where you kind of like you recognize and, and as an artist, you, you feel like you're closer to a one-to-one -one when you're creating your poses. But I would, I would say that it's, it's not necessary at all because it's, that's, that's where the artistry comes in. Um, you, when you're creating your pose library, you're binding uh, your actor's performance or your actor's expression onto your characters. And that's where the artist can really interpret, you know, how does this person, how does this character move his face in comparison with, with the performer? And uh, with that binding, Facial will kind of like interpolate every time the actor does blank with his, with their face, the character will do the same, whatever pose you provided. So um, I've been fortunate to work on characters that look nothing like their actor counterparts, for example, Rocket Raccoon or the Ninja Turtles or things like that, where their faces were very extreme and stylized, and yet face wear was able to hold hold up very, very well. Uh, as long as as the poses that we provide are consistent with, uh, with themselves, then uh, I think you'll be surprised. Definitely, I would recommend that you experiment with it because uh, I think you'll be surprised. Uh, sorry, that last question was from Sharon Hussein. Just wanted to give credit to that. Next question sure. here is from uh, Joseph D. D'Alessandro, who said, the biggest barrier for me for adopting facewear is the cost of a headcam. Are there any more affordable options? Uh, and will facewear offer a cheaper option for that anytime soon? I'll I'll take this one, but I'm happy sure. to talk or have you talk through the stationary setups if you've explored through that too. So I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In in general, Joseph, yeah, there's a there's no nothing stopping you from using any camera source to run through our software. Uh, in general, Facebook works best if you can frame your actor really well. You can get good even lighting across their face, like Simon overviewed. But um, we have a lot of teams that are working with webcams or um, like a GoPro or stationary camera as an input source. Um, but you control a lot of your environment if you do have a good head-mounted camera because there's less shake. The camera is always being consistent no matter where the actor is turning and what they're doing. Uh, and as far as your second question, as far as a more affordable option for face wear, uh, there's a couple things right now. We do have an indie head cam, so that one's based around a GoPro. It's a really good entry point. A lot of indie teams, um, students and schools adopt that, small one-man projects, things like that. They use the indie head cam. Also, some animators use it at their desk in order to quickly put it on, get a pickup shot, something like that, so they don't have to run down to a studio if it's a, if it's a larger environment. Uh, but alternatively, we do we are running a promotion right now on our Mark III head cams. We've got a handful of refurbished ones that are being sold right now at the lowest price point we've ever offered them for. So might be right for you, might not, but I um, want to make sure that you're aware of it if in case the Mark IV is completely out of your budget. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, Simon, if you've, yeah. you've tested the stationary shots probably, so. Maybe yeah, exactly. Uh, th those are really good options. There's, uh, from my experience, having worked with both stationary and and the head cam. Of course, the head cam is, as like you were saying, it really frames the face and it gives the actor full mobility in you know how they how they move around. Um, in terms of head cams, I've seen a lot of uh, DIY solutions online, which I find very entertaining. Uh, you know, using bicycle helmets and, and poles, and telescopic poles, and uh, either with an iPhone or, anyways, people people have gotten very creative with uh, at home solutions, um, and uh, even. Um, but if if you're not using a head mounted solution, uh, there's tons of webcams now on the market. I, I remember like three four years ago, finding any fast frame rate cameras. That's usually what you want to go for. Anything like at 60 frames. There are some now that you can find for 90 or 120 frames a second. Those might be too much for our needs, but I would say if you're, if you're looking for a stationary camera and you're not concerned about body and you're just going to be aiming at a camera, uh, definitely 60 frames per second is a, is a good place to start. Um, some of them can go up to 4K, but the resolution isn't so much the priority. I would say favor resolution. You could even record at, at 720, 60 FPS. Um, another thing that I will mention for stationary cameras is that you have to keep in mind that for analyzer, uh, if I'm smiling forward and I'm smiling at a three quarters and like this, it's kind of like it's evaluating different types of training frames. So uh, the more that you move your head, the more that analyzer kind of has to interpolate through all the poses that you're giving it, uh, making it a little more inconsistent. So as much as possible, if you're going to be shooting on a stationary, try to keep your, your head static, even if it's not supernatural. Um, so those are kind of like the pros and cons of both. Uh, I do think that I dive into that that chapter 
about like different different camera styles uh, methods and and the, the yeah the quality they get out of it. A uh, question here from Miles Quinn, and this is moving uh, into the analyzer section. Uh, which base group does the nose need to be assigned to? In oh, analyzer, sorry. Yeah, the nose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the nose is actually. The analyzer camera targeter. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the nose the nose uh, markers in the analyzer they're actually kind of like the the anchor point between all your face groups. So generally, my, my advice is to always include the nose with the eyes first. I, that's just a preference. I don't think the software really cares which one you start with. But given that the eyes are the, some of the easiest to track throughout your timeline, including the nose in there and making sure that it's solid throughout your timeline, you can, you can lock them down so that any changes you make in your brows or your mouth don't affect the nose. Um, and uh, once you're, you're tracking for your nose is solid, then the, it kind of anchors the other markers, uh, the other face groups in place. Uh, as for the in retargeter, anything ben, ben, below the eyes essentially belongs to the mouth. So squints, uh, nostril flaring, uh, asymmetry in the mouth, basically all that is considered the mouth group. And then you've got the eyes and, and the brows separate. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got one here that says, how does what you overviewed in the courses differ from the small scale versus a large scale production? Interesting. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I really like uh, about this analyzer retargeter combo pipeline is that a, one user could basically run a project, you know, a small scale project. Like I, the reason I wanted to do some of those personal projects is to try to see like how much can I accomplish on my own at home and the MetaHumans definitely makes that a lot easier. Um, but versus a large scale production, that's why I really felt it was important for me to at least do an introduction to batch processing, because I do think that it's kind of this uh, hidden gem of faceware. Once you once you understand how to work, you know, you've worked a couple of manual uh, jobs in both Analyzer and Retargeter, and you understand, you start noticing the repetitive nature of it. That's where you start, your brain starts figuring, hey, I think I can automate this. And uh, being able to understand how the functions work, I really tried to make it as as approachable as possible because I know scripting can be kind of daunting. Python in general, for somebody who's never done any, can can it can seem daunting. So I I really made it, um, uh, yeah, as as approachable as possible. So to add, to answer your question about like a small scale versus a large scale production, I I think the course kind of covers both uh, both scenarios. Cool. I have a question here from Rick Casaneda who says, can you talk about how Analyzer learns over time and gets better when you work with the same actor and mm -hmm. model? Uh, the, the disclaimer would be that there is diminishing returns, right? So the, at, at the beginning, that's, that's why I, I had put that um, suggestion that le less is more. So really start with just like your, your, your key poses. You try to uh, identify them in your timeline. And you let analyzer fill in those the blanks in between, and that's with a facial ROM. That's usually the fastest way to get started because you're asking your performer to kind of like hit everything they're capable of doing with their face. <clears throat> but of course, in in natural performances, they're bound to do something that wasn't included in the ROM. So the ROM for me is really just the starting starting uh, point. You're building out that foundation, and you're you're trying to capture as many of those expressions as possible, both in analyzer and then in retargeter. And then when you start incorporating actual lines of performance, you might find a couple of frames that, oh, you know what, turns out analyzer kind of skipped through that one or, or wasn't as accurate as I would have wanted. Then you can go stamp in new training frames and include those into your tracking model. And so to kind of like you, you mentioned in your question, the uh, iterative process, the more you, you work on a specific actor, the more that you can incorporate those um, training frames. And where I was mentioning the diminishing return is that if you start adding too many of the same poses with only minor differences, then Facebook kind of does, doesn't know, uh, Analyzer doesn't really know, do I pick this one or that one? And it kind of teeters between the two training frames. And that's where you really get like those, those jitters in your data. Um, that, that comes with uh, experimenting and, and you'll start noticing whether your level of tolerance on certain, on certain training frames, like you're pausing on a frame that Analyzer interpolated and you're like, so is it worth adding this minor adjustment or kind of leave it and I'll fix it in retargeter? That's, there's no right answer for that. That's uh, every, every user kind of gets their own uh, um, comfort level, I guess. 
makes sense to me. Um, here's a question from Miles Quinn that says, how helpful are tracking markers during face wear recording versus no tracking markers? Um, for building a facial ROM, I would say it's, it's, it's very, very useful, but it's really just for the user, not for the software itself. Um, in the course, I kind of show how you can go throughout your timeline and just kind of bookmark your, your timeframes or your, your specific key expressions on the timeline without making any, any manual adjustments, uh, simply to, to kind of populate your timeline. And then with the, the hotkey, you're, you can hop between your training frames. And then because you have your, your facial markers drawn on the face, you don't even have to question where to place them. You just kind of just pull, snap, move on to the next one. And you can work extremely fast that way versus not having any facial markers, you tend to have to find a mole or some you know, beauty marks or even like a, a rogue eyebrow that's sticking out or something. Like just those like visual cues to try to, try to mark, you know, lock your landmarks. Um, so facial markers as a starting point, I would definitely recommend it. I usually have a habit of keeping them, even if, I, even if we're not gonna do any manual adjustments after the batch process, but if you if there's ever like a, an exception where you have to go in and do some polishing, it's really nice to have those the the, the facial markers drawn on the face. Um, but we did do the experiment where we we trained a face with the facial markers, and then batch processed uh, footage that had no facial markers. And it's as long as it's the same actor, the the, the, the tracking works works very well. I got a follow-up question about uh, black and white videos and in your experience, if they're problematic, this is from uh, Jeremy Menuir. Uh, I'll have to be honest, I've only worked off of color footage so far. Uh, the the current project that I'm working on will be the first time that I work with infrared. So maybe contact me in about a month and I'll let you know. <laughs> and I can kind of give you some other I fill in the gaps there. Jeremy, um, yeah, in general, definitely. if we can see the features of the face, we know that the software will be able to track these different, do the first round of tracking really well, right? Where you can track where the eyebrows are, the eyes, the, the mouth. Um, the, I will say our tech is based off of color video and color information for the pixel tracking. So there is a little bit of handcuffing for the technology to give you the best results if you aren't using color vi value video. Um, but that first round of tracking where we are fusing feature tracking, it, it sh should still work just as well. So we have lots of users who kind of combine headcam sources. Um, of course, we recommend ours in order because the backbone of our tech is built, built off of it, but you can get through it. Uh, to, to kind of jump on that one too, it's uh, uh, I'll be experimenting with Facebook Portal. Uh, I believe it was built in mind with uh, different resolutions, different frame rates, different lighting variations, as well as color versus infrared. So based on the, uh, I believe it was in the webinar or maybe I've seen it somewhere else that uh, portal was being applied onto infrared and it, it seemed to work very well. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to getting that hands-on time myself. Yeah, that's true. I can confirm that. <laughs> I'm trying to keep everything about Analyzer, but in the back of my mind, that's actually what I'm thinking about yeah. is portal does that. Uh, <laughs> but let me, uh, let me move into this one. This is from Chris Amrod who says, what would you say is the biggest challenge faced when placing, making consistent marker placement in the analyzer? I'd say trying to minimize human error. That's that's unfortunate, but it, it really is because when you're staring just at a single frame, you you know your eye could say like, oh, I think the marker could be here or it could be here or it could be like. So a lot of times you're kind of that guesswork is very very time consuming and can actually lower the quality of your tracking, which kind of goes to the point we were making earlier about the facial markers. Um, that is probably the hardest reason to, to remain consistent with ourselves. And uh, the flip looking, I mentioned that in, in this presentation, but being able to hop between your poses, you'll see whether uh, a landmark is kind of hovering from one pose to another, or whether it's moving, moving consistently with the amount of, of actual motion in the face. Um, I'm trying to see, I guess jitters, uh, not just jitters, but like uh, if it's a kind of like a running sequence or something where the helmet is shaking, that's kind of out of our control in terms of how, how well the landmarks stick to the face. Uh, and that might just require as a user to add more training frames just to kind of anchor down until the footage gets steady again. Those are all kind of um, tricks you develop as, as you work with a, a, a wide you know, array of different types of videos. I hope that answers the question. I think mm -hmm. I kind of steered off course. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh... 
I'm trying to trying to go chronologically, like right, capture mm -hmm. an analyzer, then retargeter. But everybody's yes. there's a lot of good questions here, so sometimes I'm going to be jumping around. But I, I did want to get to this one next, which is um, we can hop this around. One. Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 bounce around a little bit. This is going to be towards the end of the pipeline. But how hard is it? Uh, this is from Dave Norman, who said, "How hard is the data to manipulate after? Do animators have to do a polishing pass? And if so, how challenging is that to modify?" That's that's one of my favorite aspects of Faceware. You know, with with having tested other other face facial animation solutions, uh, with Faceware, it's kind of the results are, for lack of a better term, more raw. It's it's spot on with what you track. Whereas other software tend to out of the box try to give you like an auto smooth or something something that kind of like glosses over your data. I rather have you know jitters and all, and then I can basically choose where to polish uh, wh where necessary, or or actually you know kind of punch up the animation where 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 it's going to cost you know um, give us the best return on our investment, especially with close up uh, uh, with our cameras and all that. Whereas if you, you had an animation solution that kind of glosses over, you're kind of stuck with that data across your entire timeline. Um, so the, the accuracy of uh, going from analyzers tracking data into retargeter, uh, I, I, I do feel there's a lot of control and individual control on each controller. Uh, and the fact that the face groups are separated means that you can um, have a higher pruning or smoothing value on the brows than the mouth or the eyes. Whereas maybe the other solutions would kind of treat the face as a whole and you don't really have that compartmentalization uh, between the face groups. Um, and having you know trained some some animators that don't necessarily have like the, the the technical background and vice versa, having somebody who comes with a technical background coming into more of an artistic background, it's it's interesting that 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 crossfading of skills is uh, um, definitely one of the the, the advantages of, of of working with this type of performance capture data. Um, now you're saying how much how much work is involved. I, that really comes down to the importance of the shot and the importance of the character and the proximity to the camera. Like all, all of those are, are factors to determine how much how much polish time do you really want to put after the uh, after the out of the box solution of retargeter. A bunch of questions about metahuman. So I just want to tackle most of these in a row here. So first one, mm -hmm. um, somebody's asked, how did you make your personalized metahuman? Uh, there's a couple of tutorials out there that show you how to orbit uh, a, a smartphone around your head. Like it's video based, but it'll take uh, pictures at different angles. To, you're doing a, a scan based out of video, and then you can find um, other tutorials on the scan to uh, scan to metahuman. So once you have this sort of very noisy mesh, because usually what comes out of a out of a scan is a very high dense, uh, you know, million poly uh, type of mesh that's got bumps, especially especially in parts with hair and, and things like that. It can be kind of a very noisy mesh, but in the scan to metahuman process, you're drawing out your guidelines and it's going to use the volume of your of your scan to adapt the metahuman. Um, and the results are actually shockingly good. Like that's, honestly, I didn't expect to, to have something that looks this close. Of course, it takes some some tweaking with the the materials because you know everybody's got like very specific moles in different places and I couldn't get that type of accuracy. But somebody who doesn't know me that well would just look at this and be like, yeah, that's 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 pretty close. Uh, same for hairstyles as well. That's something that you kind of have to be lucky that your haircut is in 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 the set. Um, but uh, I'm I'm fascinated with the amount of of sort of user submitted tutorials on YouTube and. Um, on on the marketplace and all that, so I'd say have fun have fun exploring. If uh, if you want, you know some 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 of my favorite ones, poke me and I'll I'll send you links. Um, but there's there's definitely the community of of users exploring metahumans is one of the uh, one of the highlights for me. That I I never felt that I'm the only one figuring this stuff out. There's just tons of people who've done it before I even I even got involved. I got a question from Sharon again that says, "How would you? How does the workflow change for a blend-shaped setup instead of using metahumans?" Uh, yeah. Okay. So metahumans, they have the the controller panel. So generally, that's what retargeter would be would be uh, driving. But if you have sliders, uh, a retargeter works just as well. Especially if, as an animator, you're used to to keyframing sliders 
it's it's a very different kind of workflow. Same as same as a joint based rig, right? Because some some rigs will have bones, and your controllers are directly on the face, whereas MetaHumans is is the sort of the traditional panel on the side. All of those methods work because when you're storing your poses in Retargeter, all it's looking for is um, a set of registered animatable parameters, whether it's you know translation X or a, a blend shape uh, slider, or or even a joint. All of those you're you're registering them in your character setup, and then every time you create a custom pose in Retargeter, uh, whenever whenever your tracking data tells it to call a specific pose, it's going to find it from your from your library. Um, so I wouldn't say there's much of a difference. It really comes down to what are you used to animating, um, and and Retargeter will just adapt to whatever you provide it. Kemkaya is asking, does one have to calibrate with Retargeter again if you want to change your MetaHuman or use a different MetaHuman in Unreal? That's an interesting question because you could essentially animate any character. For example, if you had a generic uh, male or female character that you're that you're animating, the control panel remains the same regardless of which MetaHuman you're using. So if you really wanted to, you could have all your animations pass through a single MetaHuman. And then you could just transfer, export your FBX files for animation and apply that to any other MetaHuman. And you should get relatively close uh, results. Now, I'll give you some examples where that may not work or that there may be some ad adjustments required. The easiest example is if so you've got somebody who's got tiny beady eyes and you've got somebody who's got really large eyes, the, the translation of the blink controller should be, rel should be the same value. You would expect that at 100% of a blink, it's the same blink on both characters, but you may have some clipping in your eyelids or something depending on on the scale of your metahuman. So those kind of examples may mean that you may have to do some manual adjustments afterwards. But if if you're if you're transferring animations from one character to another, generally those are not your pr principal characters. It, whether it's in your video game or in your movie or whatever it is, um, you wouldn't generally want to pass all your animations through a single metahuman. With the goal of, of you know uh, transferring it to others, um, but but yeah, it's definitely transferable because your controllers are all named the same and, and they're supposed to be normalized. And then this one's kind of piggybacking off of that. This is from Miles Quinn that says, "Do you recommend exports be made as FBX files or Maya project files?" I've always used FBX files, so I can't speak to any other methods. Um, I think we've we've used uh, in-house custom uh, export files and things like that, but FBX seems to be pretty universal. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not too familiar with the uh, Maya export files. A uh, question about uh, from Ricardo Montanez who says, "How do you capture neck rotation?" Uh, the neck rotation generally would come from your body mocap. Uh, or if you're keyframing it. As you'll notice in, in most of these shorts, I tend to frame it just above the shoulder. Like it's a, a nifty trick that you don't have to animate much of the body or just a couple of joints doing this. And, and hey, there you go, you sold your shot. Um, <laughs> th this, this hand here that we're seeing is like probably the most complex that I've, uh, I've had to do. Um, but yeah, the neck itself, um, you could incorporate it into your head tracking, but generally I would recommend to keep that as part of your body. Because the neck will 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 follow the torso, so if you're, I would say keep that as part of your your body animation. Let's go into, let's go through this question. Uh, Rick Castaneda who said, with the Mark IV wireless headcam system, do you need additional lighting in your room, or can the light on the Mark IV system work by itself? Um, I haven't worked with the Mark IV yet, uh, but I. Actually, I'll, I'll throw that question back to you, given that you, sure. you probably have more experience with that. Yeah, no problem. I know that uh, you you have a lot of experience setting up the Mark Threes for Guardians and from other projects. But Rick, in general, the Mark IV does, we do use it as like the fill light, as the main light source for your actor. But if your environment lighting is really nice, if you have a lot of bounce light, if it's really evenly lit by in general, then you can turn the, the head cam light down. Usually, uh, every every room, every stage, every VO booth are different. so the light is designed so that you can turn it up if you are finding that there's too many shadows from 
whether it's harsh overhead lights or the bars themselves are casting shadows. Uh, very often you'll just turn the light up on the head cam itself so it fills any of that. It's that way the actor is moving around and there's good lighting here, but bad lighting when they move across the volume that it, you're staying very consistent with that main light on their face from the head cam. The Mark IV has two light panels. The Mark III had that single light panel, which I know, Simon, you're more familiar with there. I just had a, a funny anecdote that uh, there was one time I was shooting in a room that had really, really harsh lighting. So I just turned off all the lights in the room and I was basically filming in pitch black, but I, the only light source was, was the head cam. And that ensured that I had consistent lighting throughout my sequence. Yeah, we've done that. We've done that where stages are like, just let's dim the lights really low and then we don't have to boost the head cam light as hard as possible. Uh, and we've also done the opposite where it's, hey, uh, what's best here is just to turn all the lights in the room up and then turn the helmet cam off. Uh, and that way, especially in like a VO setting, if, if everything works right, right and they're not moving around and causing shadows. Uh, so there's, there's a little bit of Q&A and trial and error for your guys' space and walking through it, but use the monitor, kind of go back and forth and see, just, just stare at it as your actor's going through a natural performance and you can get there in no time. Uh, question here from uh, Joseph, uh, see, Joseph de South D'Alessandro, sorry, Joseph, who said, how does the workflow like this compare with NVIDIA's audio to face if you've used it? Uh, I haven't used NVIDIA's audio to face solution. I've used other audio to facial animation solutions. Um, I'll say that the lip sync generally is the strongest uh, aspect of them because they have a good understanding of phonemes and the timing, especially if you provide a text file, it kind of lines up uh, surprisingly well and it's able to articulate really, really nicely. Um, is, and it also provides tongue, which is something that video-based won't give you. Um, uh, however, the upper part of the face is where it generally struggles because based on your audio, it doesn't really have any emotional cues. It might have volume to be able to pick up intensity and kind of like prompt an eyebrow up or a blink, or you know, sometimes it'll even try to blink as an anticipation to a high volume. This I'm talking about generally other audio solutions. Um, there's also systems where you can kind of tag in emotions at the beginning of your sentence or in the middle. And all of these require a lot of manual input to try to get something that looks natural and realistic. Um, there's uh, one approach that we, that we did on, on the previous project is to replace the mouth uh, on top of a performance capture footage. So the upper part of the face can be based on video, uh, video performance and the mouth can be uh, generated just on an audio track. It, for example, a shoot that you didn't um, you didn't do performance capture, you did, you don't have the footage for. So overlaying both of those, you're using both software at its full uh, at, at its uh, full potential, like, not full potential, but like you're using the strengths of both in order to get like the the best kind of hybrid performance. A hmm. uh, question here from Fabrizio Casagrande who says, if I use mocap for the entire body except face, and then I import facial animation, are they compatible? Uh, depending on which characters, and that, that really comes down to the pipeline that you've set up for yourself. I think it was one of the first questions. Uh, we were talking about using a clap to try to line up your two medias, uh, depending on which one was shot first. The other one kind of piggybacks on the timing of the other. So if you shot your, first, your face first, then you kind of listen to the audio and you move your body to the timing of that, uh, or vice versa. If you already have your body motion, you kind of you could look at a video and then perform your face in a webcam and try to hit the cues of the body performance. So that's really comes down to it comes down to how your team wants to work and uh, um, also it could come down to if you if you're working with actors it could be a matter of booking them like if you book your body actors first and then your facial performers after so that's that could be a production uh, requirement as well. Uh, I think we have some questions that are going to steer more into a different direction, but I want to throw this one to you. How does Facewear to Live Link work? Facewear to Live Link. Uh, that's we're talking about more uh, Facewear Studio, so the real-time approach. Um, that's I, I feel like I'm not to be a broken record, but the it really comes down to which type of production you're doing. So everything that I've presented in this course and in this webinar is uh, what I like to call the offline approach. So it's not the intention of having a performer's uh, data being translated directly to a character. So being able to, to um, record a person live and have that data applied onto a character, Live Link is excellent for that. Uh, it gives you really, really uh, quick uh, translation of your performance onto your character. 
Um, generally, that's not something that you will, I'm gonna step back. I was going to say that generally you don't, you're not gonna retouch those animations, especially if it's something like a VTuber or something, you kind of record it and it's stamped in time and that's all it is. But that's not necessarily true. There are people using real time with the intention of making short films. You can, you can use your um, take recorder and then stamp your keyframes and then polish it in a very similar style that I present in this course as well. So choosing to work with Faceware Studio uh, to quickly get a first pass of animation and then you might spend more animation, sorry, more polish time on the back end versus this is more time spent on the front end with the tracking, but you get better animations out of the box. So that really comes down, I think, to preference. Um, but yeah, Live Link being able to feed in your performance directly into Unreal is uh, something that I'll admit, I don't have too much experience, but there is a uh, another course on the same uh, Unreal online learning platform by uh, Nick Justician, I hope I pronounced his name right, uh, which is a very good course that, I, that I, I learned a couple of tricks of how to polish directly in sequencer from his course. Uh, and he is a, his course is a lot more focused on the uh, the real time recording process. Yeah, great. I love that course too. Nick, uh, Nick's a great guy. A question here from Rick that says, "How long does it usually take to analyze a ROM?" That depends on your level of experience. Um, I it's not to toot my own horn, but I think I'm about a one day per ROM <laughs> for for the tracking part, and then maybe another day on the shared poses in Retargeter. Uh, a new user could, you know, could spend about two to three days uh, tracking a, a facial ROM in Analyzer for the first time, and then maybe another two, three days for for Retargeter. I would say that's about the average. So if you if you know how many characters you're going to have in your production, whether it's a game or a short film or whatever it is, you kind of have to budget that, especially if you're going to be working with volume. Like I use the example of the short film. If you know that your sequence is five minutes, I would say don't even bother with a facial ROM. I'd say just tackle your, your performance uh, as a standalone. You could still build a tracking model and a shared pose so that you could work iteratively from one video to another. But the idea of a facial ROM is because you're going to be wanting to batch you know, hundreds of lines of performance. Um, other than that, a facial ROM, it, it's good for experimenting. If you really want to stress test your character and just see how, um, you know, what, what your capable, what your, your character rig is capable of doing in in comparison with the the performer. I would definitely say a ROM is a good place to do that. We are just at the hour here. I have a handful of questions about Portal that I wanted to go through, but before I do those, uh, Simon, I have one other question here from Tom Auger that says, "Have we figured out yet how to keep the metahuman head attached to the body when applying facial animation FBXs to heads or some other animation to the body?" Might be more specific to Tom, but have you ever experienced anything like that? I've, I've seen a lot of chatter online. I have to say that I've been fortunate that I haven't had too much of that issue. Granted that I'm not doing extensive body animation. Like I was mentioning, it's very, very simple. It's a lot of just hand keyframes. So I'm not I'm not coming from motion capture, uh, specifically to most, to the metahumans. So, uh, but I did see a couple of tutorials floating around that seem to resolve this issue. So I would say do uh, maybe a quick uh, Google search or something on YouTube, and uh, I think you'll find your answer there. Sorry, I couldn't answer that one. Uh, so let me just rapid fire a lot of these questions. If everybody heard your tease about face for a portal, and then there was a lot of questions that came in like, wait, what is this? So I just, I was saving awesome. them to the end because I want to make sure we answer them, but focus yeah. on analyze for a targeter and what you were talking about with MetaHumans and Unreal. So yeah. um, quick question, or uh, I'm going to go through some of these. So Joseph de Alessandro said, when will portal be available? I think you had also asked, if it's available for just consumers or enterprise people, uh, enterprise teams. Let me just take that one real quick. So Portal is available now. Uh, right now it is uh, being rolled out as like an enterprise style solution. So teams that have lots of content to get through, if you're working through dozens of hours of performances, um, that's really where you're, you're gonna get the most value out of running something like this. But at the same time, as, as Simon mentioned, uh, Analyze, replacing the analyzer portion of a pipeline with portal is the value save. You're, you're just completely eliminating the time it takes to create these tracking models. Um, so it is available now. We are doing trials of it on a individual basis. You can just simply reach out to Faceware and we can set something like that up with you. So feel free to email sales at Faceware. You'll get a hold of me and a couple other members and we can walk through setting something like that up. Um, there's also questions here about 
the price point for for a portal that is specific that is specific to the amount of content you guys would want to use over the course of a year generally uh, that's not to say we have tiers it's it's completely unlimited you know your team could put in 10 minutes or 10 hours of data and portal will work the same way uh, but as far as how often your team wants to use it how many people are logged on to at the same time that's where we really just need to understand each team's needs and then we can get all that information over to you and then one other thing was asking about well when will this that kind of tech be available to smaller scale teams it's definitely something on our plate just keep in keep form to our channels for rolling out options for that in the immediate future we do have um basically a service-based option if your team only has a few minutes or up to an hour of data that you want to process and get the you know skip the time or do the time savings uh, by skipping analyzer we have a service option where you your team could just send that data to us and we can re-deliver it at a much lower much lower entry uh, price for portals technology so we're happy to walk through that and even do sample data sent to anybody that that wants to do that but besides that, I have one other question from, actually, I'll be honest, there's like a dozen more questions we just didn't get to, and I apologize to everybody, but I have one other question from, um, I believe it was Brian who said, uh, if I'm going through your course and I get confused, is it okay for me to reach out to you, Simon, or how? what is the Absolutely. best way to uh, I'd say I'd say just to keep things uh, in one location and keep it professional, I'd say LinkedIn is a good good place to contact me. Uh, there's also my my uh, email address on, on my website that you can go check out. Um, but uh, yeah, there's the the platform itself doesn't lend to a sort of a back and forth between the instructor and the students. Uh, so yeah, contacting me directly on on the, the social of your preference, let's say. Yeah, and then on our side of Facebook side, if you have like a licensing problem, you know, if you're working through this with Simon, but there's something wrong with your trial or anything, you can always reach out to us. We have a full support team that we can help you too. But just want to throw that in there too. But uh, at, at that point, I think we're we're pretty much going to wrap it here, Simon. I want to again thank you for your time and walking through and your gracious, uh, you know, lending all this time and effort into this for us. It's been really helpful, and I know the community appreciates it too. My pleasure. Really glad to do it, and thanks for everybody for tuning in and and for all of the uh, the uh, very diverse questions. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Well, until the next time we do one of these, we'll see you then. Appreciate it. Goodbye.